All right, sweet. Hello, everyone. I am Zach, and this talk is writing a Rust program without a single line of code. Um, it's going to need to be kind of quick and a little bit crazy, so, you know, perk up, you know, sit up and, and see if we can get through this. And if you get confused, that's fine. It's probably going to happen. So, this is me. I teach Comp 6991 at UNSW. It's a uh, Rust focused course that we introduced just last year. Um, I also am a back end software engineer at Canva the rest of the time, and sometimes I car. That's basically my whole life. I'm glad you know me perfectly now. So, to ask the question, right, to answer this question, how can we write a Rust program without a single line of code? We need to choose, you know, we need to decide what a line of code actually is. So, we're going to start with some examples. Let x equals 42. Is that a line of code? I'm going to go ahead and say, yes, it's a line of code. There it is there. Let x is 42. But this right here, struct person, name is a string, age is u8, and height in centimeters in f32, is that a line of code? And you might say yes, but then my talk is screwed. So I'm going to say that's no. Right? This code doesn't actually do anything. It doesn't execute. It's just sort of shaping our program, structuring our program. We're just declaring a type. Right? Let's try the next one. Printlin, hello world. Is that a line of code, audience? Yes. yes, there it is. It prints hello world to the screen. But if I had a trait hello that declared a type world, is that a line of code? Yes. Uh, yeah, maybe yes, but in this case, I'm going to say no because I kind of need this one. So we're just declaring there to be a trait, but we're not actually implementing any behavior. Final, this is the, the, the toughest one here. Final question, impl default for person, default you know, produces this. Is this, you know, are there any lines of code in this? I would say, yes, there it is right there. It's the constructing self with these different things over here. That's actual code. Now, last example, impl hello for person, type world is self. Is there any code there? And I'm going to say no, right? There's no actual behavior. There's nothing that actually executes at runtime. It's just implementing a trait that declares some sort of associated type. OK, so in theory, we now have understood what a line of code is. So how can we write code without a single line of code then? Well, welcome to hell. Less fire than I thought. Hell is unique to each individual. Oh, so what's mine? You have to write Rust only with types. Oh dear. So let's try and implement something simple first, like uh, or, logical or. So that's the idea of you know false or false is false, but say false or true is true. True or true is also be true, right? So. In the world of types, structs are our values. So I declare a struct false and a struct true. Note that they don't have any fields. It's just like a unit struct in Rust. Right? Traits define our functions in this fancy type world. We have a trait or with some associated type output. And then impuls, implementing these traits with the associated types, actually define our functions. So watch this. I have impl or for a tuple of the type false and the type false, and I declare the associated type output to be false. Then false true gives me true, true false gives me true, and true true gives me true, right? No code here, but you can kind of see the structure of a logical or forming here. Type resolution calls our functions. So see up the top there, type function call one equals the tuple of false and false as it implements or. What is the output? What is the associated type output of that? And similarly with false true is or, what's that output? If I print out the name of those types, stood any type name of function call one, function call two, you look further down, you'll see playground false, playground true. Type resolution calls our functions. And you might go, wait, hold up. That's code. You cheated, right? OK, fine. Well, let me try something else here. I'm going to def define a trait never. And I'm just going to say I'll never, ever implement this trait, I promise. I'm also going to define a trait print. But this colon here means that in order to implement print, you must first implement never. And then I'm going to implement print for that function call type. Wait, that's illegal. In order to implement print, if I go back here, in order to implement print, you need to implement never. But function call doesn't implement never. So then when I cargo build, it prints our value. What? No, it doesn't. That's just an error message. No, look right there. See there, the trait bound true never is not satisfied. So I use a little bit of said, and look at that. Cargo build prints true. <laughs> Amazing. And so we can also clean up or a little bit here. So this is a little bit of a fancy transformation. We say on the right hand side here, implement or for false and any other type, right hand side, because no matter what, like, you know, we have false on the left hand side. If the right hand side is true, then it'll be true. If the right hand side is false, it'll be false. And then with 
the next implementation, their true right-hand side, doesn't matter if right-hand side is false or true, the app will be true. It's a sort of nice way to neaten things up. And with just that, we have our first no-code program. It does logical or, and we build it in order to run our code. Right, nothing gets run, amazing. Okay, so now we're going to do the big project of this lightning talk, which is summing a list of non-negative integers. So, wait, what's an integer? Maybe something like u32, that's a good one, you know, non-negative integers. No, it's not. u32 is the type of integer values, right? We don't have values. Our types are our integers. So we will need to birth an algebra. We define the number zero, right? And a successor type, S, which stands for successor, of some other number N, right? With just these two constructions, we now have created integers. Zero is just Z, one is the successor of zero, two is the successor of one, three is the successor of two. If I say impl print for three, which is our fancy way of saying print this type out, you get S of S of S of Z. If you're familiar with the piano axioms, this is how you actually build integers from the ground up. So there is a little aside here about phantom data. You can't throw a generic type parameter if you don't actually use it in the type. Rust wasn't really anticipating people to be doing crazy stuff like this when they you know, were designing this. So I will have to throw phantom data around the place, but it doesn't actually do anything. It's not really code in this case. So similarly to birthing integers, we will need to birth lists ourselves. We can't use vec. We need to do it ourselves. So we define the empty list nil, kind of like defining zero. And then we define a constructor of an element x and a remaining list of x's. Right? Phantom data, you can just sort of ignore it a bit. And with this, we have lists. So you see I have a type list up there as cons of 1, comma, cons of 2, comma, cons of 3. And I signify the end of the list with nil. Kind of like, say, like a null terminated C string. Print it out, and you get, you know, s of 1, ss of, you know, oh, sorry, s of 0, ss of 0, sss of 0, end of the list. Now, integer addition we define a function, right? Add is a function, that is a trait when we're working with types. And uh, then we have to do the implementations. So if I add together zero and some other number, then zero plus the number is just gonna be whatever the number is, right? Output is the right-hand side. So this one's easy. This one's a bit more difficult, right? So we have to sort of implement this a bit functionally. So bear with me. We implement add for a successor of some number and then some other random number, whatever it is. and if I, if you see on the, after the where line here, I say add is, uh, like I take n and the right hand side and I effectively call add on those values. So we had s of n plus right hand side. I'm asking what is n plus the right hand side and I'm gonna call that output n plus right hand side. And so our eventual output is just the successor of n plus the right hand side, right? So we're actually calling ourselves recursively in a certain sense. Right, we had s of n plus the right-hand side. We do n plus the right-hand side and then take the successor of that at the very end. And this is enough to have a functional implementation of integer addition, why and we can test it out. Six y successor. Because it's the n plus the right-hand side is the answer. Why is it the successor of it? Because we are actually defining this on the successor of n plus the right-hand side. So if we add up n and the right-hand side, we're going to be one short. Oh, okay. Right. So then we take the successor of that overall n plus right-hand side. So imagine n is 2, we're adding up 3 plus some number, we do 2 plus the number and then add 1 at the very end to get us back to 3. This is our, like our recursive... Is a necessary way of doing it? It is a necessary step and it's something that you'd probably be very familiar with if you're doing things like functional programming. You often have to think in terms of recursion and eventually we'll reach our base case at the very end when that number hits 0 and we just get the right hand side out. Um, so if I print together 1 and 2 added together, you see I get 3, s, s, s of z. And I could throw in other numbers there and it would similarly work. Finally, our last thing here is to add up a list of numbers. So I'm going to create a sum list fun uh, trait, right? We're working in types. An empty list is pretty easy. Adding up a empty list will just give us a zero in this case. And then the other case is a little harder. So we're saying if we add up a, can, a list with like multiple things, right? N and then the remaining Ns, we do the same sort of trick where with that n n sum, we add up, you know, recursive, sorry, we say our uh, n's sum up the rest of the list. That's the first way bound there. n sum list gives us n sum. And then we take n, which is the current, you know, number we're looking at, and add that together with n sum. On the next line, that gives us our total sum. Our output is then that total sum. And this actually ends up working. If I add together one, two, and three, and ask for that as a sum list output, 
I get SSS, SSSZ, right? Which is six S's, one plus two plus three is six. So to wrap things up, and I know it's been a little crazy, how far can this crazy idea go? If you go to my GitHub, at the front you'll see this typing the technical interview Rust. This is my favorite implementation in the whole thing. It's trying to check if two queens on a chessboard can actually see each other in any of the different directions. Um, so for example, when you run it, it'll spit out this chessboard of queens which are all placed and you can see very conveniently none of those queens can attack each other on the chessboard. It's a very famous uh, algorithmic problem, n queens. So what really is type level programming? I would say, this is my personal opinion here, Rust is comprised of two meta languages, your code and your types. Rust code describes a statically typed, compiled, multi-paradigm language that we all love and are very familiar with. However, Rust types describe their own language too, a language that is dynamically typed, interpreted, and functional. Your interpreter is the compiler, right? So Rust types, in this case, are Turing complete, the compiler resolving your types actually describes a Turing complete language, but the resolution of those types is extremely slow, and there are type resolution recursion limits, and that it'll only evaluate types for so long before it goes, something's probably gone wrong and I'm going to give up. Because it's Turing complete, you can actually cause infinite loops in your types, and the compiler doesn't want to just hang forever and then go, sorry. So, is any of this actually useful? In really specific scenarios, maybe. Right, so for example, using type states, which is a similar kind of idea, you can form type safe builders, which validate builder state at compile time. You might say, these three fields are required, but these two are optional, and you could validate that all the required fields have been populated using this kind of type level programming and type states, but you've gotta be really careful not to overdo it, for sure. So, I gotta have a thanks to Carl Kingsbury, otherwise known as Afia, oh, sorry, AFA who is the creator of an amazing blog post type in the technical interview. There's also a whole bunch of blah, the technical interview blog posts, and they're all fantastic. That gives us the original inspiration and a few other things there. Go check out that article. It's such a fun read, and it's Haskell, so, you know, go in with caution, naturally. And any questions? There we go. <laughs> yes? Uh, can you explain why the type language in Rust is dynamic? Yeah, so... If I go back here, I've mentioned that Rust types describe a dynamically typed interpreted language. So the compiler is interpreting for you. The idea of it being dynamically typed comes into ideas around kinds and stuff. I'm also not a formal methods person nor a types person, so I can only describe things as well as I'm really able to. Um, the reason I say it's dynamically typed is because if you look at like cons of n and n's there, for example, or maybe if I go back to like a way simpler example, what have I got to point this out? It's, oh no, it's given up on me. <laughs> I can't go further back as, apparently. All right, the remote's given up. What can I swipe on this? Oh, amazing, okay. So if I go back to implementing and, for example here, for z and some right-hand side, that's just any type here, right? Impl RHS, that's saying any type right-hand side. You could put in Z and like string, and it would spit out string, right? So it's this dynamically typed language. Your interpreter will catch it. So like the compiler will say, eventually, hey, this type ended up being the wrong thing, but it's not gonna give me the type error over here. It's gonna give it to me like five functions later when it got a string when it, you know, I was expecting to print something else out. Um, so the language itself acts like a dynamically typed language and uh, yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a wild, <laughs> wild thing to be in, yeah. If it was not dynamically typed, could it even have, if you have a compiler language that was not dynamically typed, could it be such a thing? So could you have a language where the types are not, the, the type language describes yeah. not a dynamically typed language, but maybe statically typed? I don't think I'm qualified enough to answer the question. I think maybe you can emulate these kinds of ideas with kinds. So Haskell has this idea of the, Sort of like if you tried to answer the question of uh, what is the type of a type, and you can do some crazy things that comes into yeah, what Haskell calls kinds, but I am not experienced enough to say for sure. The answer is maybe, have a look at that. <laughs> um, any other questions? Yeah, yeah. You, you don't show this to your students, do you? Oh, <laughs> so the question is do you, do you don't show this to your yeah. students, do you? Um, I did show it to my students, but it was a after a lecture, I was like, I'm about to demo you something insane. You're not going to understand 80% of it, but if you want to stick around, you can. And 
a surprising amount stuck around and a surprising amount had a fun time, but I think... Oh uh, yeah, Trey says I might have actually said please leave before I, you know, tried to poison their minds. Um, yes? Should I try to learn Should I try to learn Haskell? Um, if you like this kind of stuff, then you should read the blog post and then evaluate your circumstances. For, for your information, the blog post is this really nicely written prose that you know, injects Haskell along the way. It's a, it's a technical interview where they're writing Haskell code. And what I've done is taken the Haskell code along the way and transcribed it into Rust types. So if you go to the article, you'll see how this kind of thing will be written. Uh, the end queens problem is written in Haskell. And you can also use the Rust as a reference to try and understand what's going on along the way as well. So you'll have to figure that one out for yourself, I think. But um, yeah. Do I miss algebra? Do I miss maths? Um, do I like monads? Um, so I think it's all very interesting, but I'm probably not smart enough for most of it. Um, this is this was definitely a fun like reminder of of things learnt previously, and you know it's it's nice to play around with every now and then. But I'm pretty glad it's not my profession. I'd have to say. <laughs> Ah, so do I know about the type num library in Rust? Yeah, there are actually some cool projects that try and bring more ideas, more programs into the type language. And there are some really distinct advantages that can come along with that. Um, and if you're thinking thing along the lines of things like const generics as well, then you're probably on the right track as well. Um, type num is a awesome library, but obviously it can, it, all these things again need to be used in moderation in that, things can get really out of hand and extremely confusing quite quickly. So you have to really assess whether the benefit is going to be worth, you know, the trade-off of maintainability and understandability. How when do you test this? How do you test this? Well, that's also extremely tricky because the language doesn't, like you, the language has built-in facilities for testing, but that's for testing the language of code. So for testing the language of types, you'd probably have to build things up from scratch, like how we built printing but do you feel from scratch. Like you have more, less runtime errors and more compile time errors? Uh, yeah, you would have more compile time errors as opposed to runtime errors, maybe. But that would also be in the case where, um, like, in, in our case here, we don't actually have a runtime at all. But in the case of, you know, if you're looking at things like type stated builders and stuff, it can be really handy to hoist errors that would have occurred at runtime into occurring at compile time, which means your issue, your, your mistake gets caught in CI as opposed to waking you up at 3 a.m. when you're on call and tired and don't want to be alive at that point. So um, it can actually be a really handy tool to use, but you've got to know when to use it for sure.